Now, if we go right back to the start of your career, Carl, in the dim and distant past, did you always think you'd pursue a career in music? Was there ever a chance you'd be guided into another profession? Um, a bit, if you know much about my background, um, it'd be very difficult for me to have gone any other way, really. Um, <laughs> right. there's, uh, you know, there's, if you know about my family and stuff, which has been in print many times, but uh, I'll just mention it again. My, my family are... Um, my great-great-grandmother was a professional classical guitar player. That's as far back as we go. My grandfather and his brother were both professional musicians. One was a drummer, one was a violinist, cello player, taught at the Royal Academy, and also conducted at the London Palladium here in London during the war, the Palm Court Orchestra. Um, my eldest brother was a guitar player, professional guitar player for a while. My youngest brother is still a professional drummer. My nephew was a professional drummer for many years before he started uh, flying for Virgin Airlines. He's now a pilot. So there's a colossal amount of music in my family. My father was a piano player. Um, it just goes on. So there really wasn't a choice, you know. Well, there was a choice because we had about three. Or f we had three retail shops, and we had a couple of market stalls. So you could either work on the market stall or in the retail shop and try and develop the business or play a musical instrument. Well, you know, I tried both, you know, and I stuck with the music. So that's the way it was. But I think, you know, the the music was the stronger draw within the family. I mean, we were all just music crazy in my house absolutely so crazy. yeah I can, I can see that your parents would be really encouraging because basically growing up in the 1960s i mean it you know music was in its if you like formative uh, pop music at any rate and in its formative stages and it was perhaps perceived as glamorous but not necessarily very stable really but if you've got the backing of a, a musical family it, it must be a help um to tell you the truth you know there's always a problem you know in those years People say, when you say to people you want to be a professional musician, they'd never really take it seriously. Mm. And I, I, was, I always thought that was very strange because of coming from a family with so many professional musicians, it was the norm, you know. It was a true art form, you know, that you're entering into that's recognized around the world. And, you know, if you can be in an orchestra, what a great job that is. You've got a pension scheme and you've got this and that. And obviously I didn't want to do that personally. But I, I used to... Um, I used to think, I wonder why they put down musicians and don't think it's a serious and a proper job to have, you know. Mm. So I could never really evaluate that, you know, what, why they thought like that. And now as I get older, you know, and I'm still working and I see guys at my age who had a proper job, as they would have called it in the daytime, um, uh, aren't working and can't get work and get made redundant when they're 50 or whatever it yes. might be. And I, I kind of think, well, I wonder who was right and who was wrong, really. Precisely. I mean, I only ever did what felt right to me, you know, and it, it wasn't right at the time, and I remember leaving school, and I had to go and see what they used to call uh, a youth employment officer, and you'd go and see this chap on your last day at school, and he'd have a list of apprenticeships for you to go to, and I remember him reading this stuff out to me and saying, oh, you could go and work in the jewellery centre, you could do an apprenticeship there, you could go and work at this particular uh, company called Tufnell, they make these cards which are going to be put into these uh, into radios and, and you mention all these jobs and I would say look I have to be honest with you I've already got two jobs I, I play five nights a week in the local ballroom and I play three nights a week in a local club in Wolverhampton called the Pear Tree Club I said I, I, you know I'm making enough money I I can't work anymore. I'm working as... And he said, no, no, but this is for, for later on in life. I said, no, this is later on in life. So he said, well, what are you going to do when you leave school on Friday? I said, well, I'm leaving school on Friday. I said, and I've got an audition in London the following Wednesday with a gentleman called Chris Farlow. Huh. He said, who's Chris Farlow? I said, well, Chris Farlow's a singer. And he's got a band called The Thunderbirds. And... Um, he, um, he had a number one single called Out of Time, and he's asked me to come down and audition for his band, and I'm going to do that. So he said, well, what happens if you don't get it? I said, well, I'll cross that bridge when I get there. And, of course, I came down to London when I was 15, and I did my audition in, in Kingley Street in the Bag of Nails, and, of course, you know, I was on a plane going to Germany that following Wednesday, I think, or whatever, uh, for a three-week German tour. So my career had started. So, yes. you know, that's the way it was. But a lot of these people do, didn't understand that at the time. No, that, that you was could a... go a different way. You could do different things. 
and it was important to sort of encourage people to have a go. And that's one thing we had wrong within the structure, the educational structure at the time. We never gave people who had, you know, had a talent a real shot at doing stuff. We kind of held them back. And academically, I'm probably about average. You know, uh, business-wise, on business and the music business, I'm pretty good. You know, at the time I wasn't because I was still learning. But, you know, maybe maybe I could have done something else and been quite successful. But there was no doubt that, you know, what my father once said to me, he said, if you can do something that, you know, is your hobby and you can make a living at it, you'll do it for the rest of your life and you'll do it for as long as you want to do it. And that's the job you need not something where you're working for someone else all the time. And of course, the only thing that really filled that hole was music. And I'm, you know, most grateful and I'm, and I'm incredibly blessed and I'm, and I'm very happy and thankful to all the fans and people that we've got out there who have uh, supported me all over these mm. years. No, it was good advice from your dad, wasn't it? Yeah. As you developed your career, I mean, um, there was the perception, which I don't think current really at the now but it was certainly back in the 60s and surely the 70s that the drummer of a band was the quiet one at the back and i mean it wasn't the case in elp i mean that was different obviously you were all virtuosi and uh, you had your time under the spotlight as it were but did that ever bother you really because there were other strands of music in the 70s like i've just been reviewing some um, believe it or not uh, called jazz funk albums and you had the likes of Billy Cobham, obviously, Narada, Michael Walden and, and Harvey Mason. I mean, you, you know, they were like front men drummers, effectively. I mean, did you ever think about that? I suppose once ELP kicked in, that wasn't an issue, really. Um, well, to tell you the truth, the, 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 the first thing I saw in my lifetime that made me, be, made me decide to be a drummer was a thing called the Gene Krupa story. Uh -huh. And Gene Cooper was a well-known drummer in the late 20s, early 30s. And he was the drummer that came from the back of the bandstand to the front of the stage and, and led the band. He was Archie Shaw's drummer, classic songs like Sing, Sing, Sing and Drum Boogie. But he came to the front and became the excitement, became the engine room. He generated all this energy and became like a film star who was playing, you know, great drums at the front of the stage. And if you think about it, the Beatles, Ringo Starr was never really, it wasn't three and the drummer, it was the four of them. And he sang songs and he had as much limelight as the others. It was, it was the way it was. So times were always changing. They've always been changing. It just so happens that with ELP, you know, we just kept pushing it again. Um, I, I didn't play like a drummer in ELP. I didn't play like a Billy Cobham or a Harvey Mason. The last thing I had to do was keep time. What I did in ELP was play like a, a melodic instrument. I played lots of unison runs with keys. We tried to make it sound as orchestral and as big as possible. So the last thing that I needed to do was keep time because we didn't play lots and lots of songs. We played lots and lots of complex arrangements which needed filling out as you know to make it sound as big as we could for three people mm. so you know i've come in from a different a different angle you know all through my life to be honest with you mm -hmm. and any time that i've kind of gone the normal route of playing just songs apart from being with asia you know uh, i've made a mistake whether it be with pm or whether it be with three or whether it be with the last two uh, elp albums you know <laughs> so <laughs> It's been a strange career. It's been a strange career because when I've tried to be commercial, it's not happened, you know, on a big level. When I've tried to do it one at a time, like we did it with ELP in the early days, it's been com commercial. And as far as being a drummer is concerned, I I've always been, you know, what I am, you know. I mean, people don't employ me to keep time. Well, people don't employ me anyway, but you wouldn't come to me if you want somebody to keep time in your band because I don't do that. Yes, I do, but that's not what I'm about, you mm, know. I know, no.